Chess, a game for kings and commoners, revolutionaries, generals and their soldiers, scientists, artists, merchants, philosophers, even computers and artificial intelligence. A symbol of intellect, chess is a timeless example of strategic superiority. Those who play well are revered because chess excellence cannot be purchased. It can only be earned. Chess represents complete individual power of mind, a venue for both creativity and technical mastery. Chess captures the zeitgeist of an era and captivates our minds because chess is much more than just a game. It is a reflection of life itself. Chess is a reflection of us. Dating back to 6th century India, Shaturanga is the earliest known form of chess and bore similarities to today's game. Variations of the game spread to the Sassanid Empire or modern-day Iran, where they were taught to nobility. After hundreds of years, these early versions slowly converged into the modern game we enjoy today. Chess traveled east to China, where it evolved into a game called Xianqi. The game also traveled west, as Islam swept through Arabia, North Africa, and the Iberian Peninsula. By the Middle Ages, chess was being played throughout Europe. The game reached Mongolia through Silk Road routes, and Genghis Khan spread chess throughout the empire in the 1200s. As the European Renaissance ushered in an era of rebirth, chess became popular with the artists, scientists, and religious leaders who dominated Renaissance culture. In fact, it was a Catholic priest, Rui Lopez de Segura, who in 1561 published one of the earliest and most influential books on the game, which documented the priest's opening theories, including his namesake, the Rui Lopez, which is still a common opening nearly 500 years later. The 18th century ushered in an era of revolutions, most notably on the American continent, in France, and even in global industry. Napoleon Bonaparte was known to play chess with his generals. Benjamin Franklin, a founding father of the United States, was an avid chess player who penned the essay, The Morals of Chess, in 1786, where he wrote, Life is a kind of chess, in which we have often points to gain, and competitors or adversaries to contend with. As the beginnings of globalization shrank the world, chess evolved into a standardized game. For over a century, one could not claim dominance in the chess world without first stepping in to the venerable Café de la Régence in Paris. It was here where musical composer and infamous blindfold simultaneous player André Philidor played against Benjamin Franklin. The most notable of the players who frequented the café was the American Paul Morphy, a child prodigy who stormed the chess world. It's difficult to say who were the most influential chess champions in history. In fact, you have one player who wasn't world champion who may have been just as influential as any of the other greats, and that's Paul Morphy. After earning a law degree at the age of 20, but not being old enough to practice law in New Orleans, Paul traveled to New York City, where he won the first American Chess Congress and was recognized as the United States Chess Champion. The following year, Morphy traveled to the United Kingdom and France, where he easily beat Europe's best players, including German master Adolf Anderson, who attested that Morphy was the strongest player to ever play the game. Widely regarded as the world's best chess player, Paul Morphy stunned the chess world when he abruptly and permanently left the game to begin his life as a lawyer. Morphy's death in 1884 left a hole in the chess world that begged the question, who was the best player in the world? So Morphy was way ahead of his time 
and he ruled over his peers more than any other world champion or best player in the world, Bobby Fischer said Morphy was the most accurate player who ever lived, and he said he would beat any player today. The style of play that characterizes modern organized chess got its start in 1886 at the very first official World Chess Championship. The match pit Austrian-born American Wilhelm Steinitz against his rival, the Polish-born Brit Johannes Zuckertort, forever emblazoning these two players in the history of the sport. Wilhelm Steinitz personally claimed to be world champion from 1866 onward, paving the way for this universally recognized inaugural event. His claim wasn't without merit, considering Steinitz went on a historic 25-game winning streak between 1873 and 1882. Negotiations for the match were contentious and lasted three years before both sides finally agreed to the terms. The match would take place over two months, across three states, with 20 games scheduled. The first player to win 10 games would be named the champion. Steinitz for me is the the first guy, the the guy who sat down and wrote wrote the constitution. You know that kind of person, um, the sort of person you have at the start of your country's history. He for chess, he was the man who first put down these famous rules, and for many years we took them as the literal truth about how we start off in chess. The championship match was also a battle of theories that first played out in print from the end of the 1870s. Steinitz published articles about his new positional approach in the Field magazine. Zuckertort criticized Steinitz's theory in Chess Monthly magazine. The match was an opportunity to test out their theory in practice. On January 11th, the first round of play began in New York City. Zuckertort, the editor of Chess magazine and a protege of Steinitz, started the match strongly, winning four of the first five games a remarkable feat, creating a seemingly insurmountable lead. But Steinitz was about to expose his weakness. While much of the country was still digging out of a blizzard in the Plain States, Steinitz needed to dig himself out of a losing streak. The men headed to St. Louis for the next four games of the match. Steinitz was a ferocious attacker in his youth, but had been practicing a new positional style of play. It was a radical shift, which he outlined and defended in writing. Positional play is the art of exploiting small advantages to slowly improve one's overall position, rather than focusing on short-term attacks. Nearly a month to the day after the first round began, round two came to an end. Steinitz scored three wins and a draw. The final leg of the match took place in New Orleans. Momentum was on Steinitz's side, and Zuckertort just couldn't keep up. He lost six of the last 11 games. The final score, 12 and a half to seven and a half. Wilhelm Steinitz, the first official world chess champion, was a titan on the chessboard and brought a scientific, I think, element to the game that really set the tone for just how difficult chess would, would, be, would be to play for many years to come. In the years that followed, Steinitz defended his chess theories by writing extensively about them. He also used his insight to help the American Chess Congress to define the rules governing future world championships. Zuckertort, on the other hand, struggled with poor health following the tournament. He died two years later at the age of 46. An Austrian chess sensation, Steinitz had just moved to the US a few years before the tournament. It was only fitting that an immigrant in the United States won the World Chess Championship in the same year the Statue of Liberty was dedicated. Steinitz would enjoy the success of the World Chess Champion title for eight years. In 1894, his undefeated match play would finally come to an end. Like his predecessor before him, Wilhelm Steinitz, Emanuel Lasker was also a very uh, scientific chess player, a professor in some ways in terms of his approach to the game. But one guy I, I don't like to, to leave out, and he very often is forgotten about, is Emanuel Lasker. 
anybody who was world champion for 27 years clearly could play chess and uh, had an enormous influence on the, the game. Steinitz and Lasker were together, I think, in changing a little bit of the narrative of chess, that it wasn't just an art, it is, and it, it can be beautiful at times, but it also can be beautiful in the fact that every lie is exposed on the chessboard. There is a best move, and having a style that finds it and appreciates the principles of controlling the center, of development, of a, a, a very scientific and methodical theoretical approach to the game was sort of was sort of cemented by Steinitz and Lasker and their approach to chess uh, in that era. The young 25-year-old Lasker urged the seasoned 58-year-old to face him in the World Chess Championship before calling it quits. Lasker wanted each side to stake $5,000, but found it challenging to raise the funds. Steinitz agreed to reduce the stakes to $2,000 each which was less money than earlier championships, but still a sizable pool at that time. While many praised Steinitz for agreeing to the reduction, some have theorized that he desperately needed the money. Both players also mutually agreed that the copyright to publish each game's moves was owned by the players, marking an early and important discussion on intellectual property rights in chess. The championship would take place in three locations in the spring of 1894. New York City hosted the first eight games. Philadelphia would host games 9 through 11, followed by games 12 through 19 in Montreal, Canada. The first player to win 10 games would be declared the winner. Great competitors can't resist a challenge, and Steinitz declared he would win without a doubt. Lasker had other plans. The World Chess Championship of 1894 started off a well-balanced match. The score was tied after six games, marked by Lasker's use of the Rui Lopez opening. Lasker then took a commanding lead with five straight victories as the match transitioned from New York to Philadelphia. Steinitz briefly looked like he might bounce back in Montreal. But the young Lasker was not to be denied. The players traded wins until Lasker ultimately won the championship in the 19th game. Well, when he won against Steinitz, I know that uh, Steinitz stood up and he, uh, he shouted three times, hooray for the new world champion. Um, so it was a very, uh, very gentleman way of of uh, surrendering the crown. Unlike Steinitz, who stuck to his strategy of positional play, Lasker had a more flexible approach, changing his style from game to game. There were newspaper reports of Steinitz playing poorly while suffering from insomnia during part of the match. Details are limited, but the 16th game was played in private in a small room at Montreal's venerable Cosmopolitan Club, attended only by the players and match officials. Regardless, Emmanuel Lasker was the new world chess champion. Fans would talk about the games for years. Other chess players would emulate Lasker's style, and future generations would study his games in books, videos, and articles. For me, Lasker was the ultimate pragmatist, the ultimate uh, practical chess player. He actually knew how to pinpoint his opponent's weaknesses and take advantage. So, the first practical player. The rematch would be the first time Lasker had to defend his title. This time, in Moscow. This time around, he beat Steinitz in an utterly dominant fashion. Lasker won seven of the first 11 games. The other four were ties. Steinitz won games 12 and 13, after which Lasker won three of the last four games to retain the title. In a published letter to the press, Steinitz cited a multitude of issues surrounding his accommodations in Moscow, including overheated rooms, the lack of fresh air, and the unavailability of cold water and ice. However, 
Steinitz also claimed, in response to the question, why am I beaten so badly? He writes that Lasker was the greatest player I have ever met. Perhaps the greatest that ever lived. Fast forward to 1907. Lasker was studying for his doctorate in mathematics and thus had little time to practice chess. His challenger was Frank Marshall from the United States. His home would eventually become the famous Marshall Chess Club in New York City. Despite Lasker's studies, he crushed Marshall and held him winless throughout the competition with games in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Chicago, and Memphis. It was a battle marked by Lasker's employment of the Queen's Gambit and Marshall's use of the French defense. Marshall, in his mercurial style, would note that tedious play aimed at wearing down my opponent is averse to my nature. Lasker had no such reservations. Lasker won the first three games, then scored one win and seven draws in games four through 11, before winning the last four games for a final score of eight to zero with seven draws. A year later, Lasker would defend his title a third time, this time in Dusseldorf and Munich against fellow German Siegbert Tarasch. One of the most influential chess theoreticians and popular writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Game 14 in the match was a nail-biter. With 119 moves, it held the record for the longest game in a world championship for years. Ultimately, Lasker easily held on to his reign, beating Tarash 8-3 with five draws. The match against Tarash was conceptually a very difficult match. So the fighter was playing the theoretician, if we can put it this way, and could, it could have been a different turn of the events and a different turn of the chess history had, had Tarish won this. In 1910, Lasker defended his title twice, first in a controversial match that ended in a tie with Austro-Hungarian chess master Karl Schlechter, a strong but sometimes unambitious master. The players agreed to a best of 10 match with five games in Vienna and Berlin, respectively. The shortened match was the result of London, St. Petersburg, and Stockholm all failing to participate in raising stakes for an even longer match. Unlike Lasker's earlier title wins, this championship was dramatic and well played by both players. In fact, eight of the 10 games were draws. Schlechter won game five. The next four games were also draws, in the 10th and final game of the championship, Lasker had to win in order to tie the match and retain his title. In a letter to the New York Evening Post, Lasker wrote, the match with Schlechter is nearing its end and it appears probable that for the first time in my life, I shall be the loser. If that should happen, a good man will have won the world championship. However, Lasker came back to win the 10th game and retained his title. Later that year, Lasker was challenged by Russian-born Frenchman David Yanovsky. The entire match was held in Berlin, and in terms of the score, Lasker beat Yanovsky in the most one-sided world championship match in history. The final score was 8-0 with three draws. Emmanuel Lasker was world champion for 27 years, I mean, the name Lasker must have been known by intelligent people and, and knowledgeable people, cultivated people in general, even if they knew little about chess. A true sportsman, chess wasn't the only game that Lasker was interested in. He was a first-class bridge player and invented a game called Laska, which is similar to checkers. But it's his role as a ferocious defender and a pioneer of chess strategy and psychology that made him a star. Emmanuel Lasker successfully defended his world championship title five times. Will anyone beat Lasker's record of uh, standing on the chess front for 27 years? Honestly, I don't think so. 
he's really the first universal player, so again, he was equally good in everything, but above all, he was a fighter. War puts a lot of things on hold. Families, plans, and on occasion, the World Chess Championship. But that's not the strangest part of Jose Raul Capablanca's rise to fame. Capablanca was a personable Cuban chess prodigy who could play chess before he could read. He had been winning tournaments since he was 13 years old. By the time he was 22, Capablanca played with great intuition and fluidity, but his true object of attention was the endgame. He was ready to compete for the world title, challenging world chess champion Emmanuel Lasker. That was in 1911. The problem was the two players couldn't agree on the format. Lasker was unwilling to play the traditional first to win 10 games method. The arguing grew so intense that the men stopped speaking to each other. A few years later, they reconciled at the 1914 St. Petersburg chess tournament. They finally agreed to terms for a championship match. Lasker came from behind to win that event in May. And then only a few weeks later, Gavrilo Princip would assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. World War I had begun. It was reported that Emmanuel Lasker lost his entire fortune in Germany during the war and was even detained for a short period. There would be no World Chess Championship for another seven years. In 1920, negotiations between Lasker and Capablanca resumed, mainly through several correspondences. Chess critics in London criticized both men so harshly that it became a strain on their friendship. Lasker resigned his title in the dispute over match conditions and named Capablanca his successor. But Capablanca stated, I would much prefer to play for the title, regardless of the outcome of the match. The chess world agreed and didn't accept Lasker's gesture, despite Lasker declining in health. Eventually, the two players agreed to play in Havana, Cuba for the 1921 World Chess Championship. The format was best of 24. The first man to win 12 and a half points, or eight games, would be declared the winner. Capablanca had been undefeated in chess competition for five years running by the time the match would start. The match was marked by both players competing theories of the Queen's Gambit decline. The difference in age and sharpness of tactical ideas would prove to be Capablanca's advantage. But the championship ended strangely. Lasker resigned from the match after 14 games, citing poor health as the reason. Despite resigning the match, Lasker stated he was convinced he could not have beaten his opponent. Capablanca was officially the new world chess champion. Capablanca was a reflection of all of his predecessors in terms of being aggressive, being creative, being a genius, as some would call him, but also being so technically sound that he would be willing to take games into the end game and win with just the smallest of advantages. Our first proper certified bon vivant. He, he loved the good life. Stories about mistresses, about romances, about um, wearing fine suits and uh, going in Fifth Avenue, you know, all that stuff. And um, he was, um, I think, the first world champion who really properly enjoyed himself. Capablanca wrote of chess in his book, Lecciones Elementales de Ajedrez. Chess serves, like few other things in this world, to distract and momentarily forget the worries of daily life. Capablanca would not have to defend his title for six years. It was September 1927 in Buenos Aires. Capablanca was the huge favorite. He had already beaten Russian player Alexander Alekin in other tournaments and not lost a single game to him. But Alekin was no stranger to the game or the pressure that comes with it. Born into a wealthy Russian family, his older brother taught him to play chess. By age 16, he was considered one of Russia's top players. Alekin's preparation checklist was complete. He had raised the required $10,000 for the match, he had studied Capablanca's games, and learned to play in his style for this match. Alekin even physically trained for the competition. All that was left was to play, and preparation showed. 
The meeting between Capablanca and Aliakin was one of the longest formal world chess matches in history. And though Aliakin won, he later admitted that even he was surprised by the victory. It was the first of many matches to come for the world championship that would be won by players who had never before defeated their opponent. Alexander Alekin, as is appropriate for someone who follows Capablanca, was the tormented one. He, he never seemed to find peace in his life. Even when I watch his games, you feel his pain somehow. During the course of the match, a decree granting Alekin's request to be a French citizen was granted. He started the match as a Russian and would win the championship as a Frenchman. The two masters made an informal agreement to play a rematch sometime within the next year, but it would never happen because Capablanca failed to raise the necessary $10,000. Yefim Bogalyubov, a Russian-born German player, then challenged Alyekin. Calling Bogalyubov a more serious challenger, Alyekin accepted despite Bogalyubov's failure to raise $10,000. The two agreed to a public match held in six different cities in Germany and the Netherlands, with Aliakin receiving $6,000, regardless of the match's outcome, and his challenger receiving the balance of the monies raised for the match. Bogalyubov had beaten past world champions, Emmanuel Lasker and Jose Capablanca, but he could not beat the reigning champ. It would be five more years, 1934, before Aliakin would have to defend his title again by facing Bogalyubov for a second time. Not only was the challenger the same, but so was the agreed upon format. It was the only championship ever held inside Nazi Germany. Many players before him could be boxed in or defined by a style or an approach. You could not box in Alexander Alekhine. His truly well-rounded approach to the game showed that the future best chess players in the world could not deny or neglect any skills that they would need to develop to be the best. Alexander Alekhine is maybe the first true super grandmaster that existed. In those days, there was no strict qualification process to challenge the title holder. Aliakin's choice for an opponent was conservative by most standards. The world was suffering under a cloud of the Great Depression. Tensions were high as Germany began to rearm and Mussolini's Italy attacked Ethiopia. The World Chess Championship, held in multiple cities and towns across the Netherlands, offered a distraction of the time. In fact, in one newspaper, the match was positioned as bigger news than the situation in Ethiopia. Dutch chess player Max Ova was considered by his peers to be a consistent player, solid but not extraordinary. Ova had won a world amateur championship, but mostly only played tournaments when it did not clash with his math teaching duties. Throughout his life, Ova refused to call himself a professional chess player. Whether it was overconfidence or simply underestimating his opponent, Alekin's seemingly safe choice wasn't a safe bet after all. Ova won the title by overcoming a three-point deficit as late as the ninth game. At the end of 30 games, Ova beat the champ by just one point. This is also a bit of a paradox. He was the amateur, he was the real amateur, but in some aspects, he was more professional than the professional chess players. He taught the professionals of his time how to work on their openings professionally. And he also taught the professionals of his time to work on their physical condition. And that's probably one big lesson that Alekhine learned from him and why he came back in the second match in a better physical condition. Aljechen would get a chance to redeem himself. And he did two years later with a record setting win, making him the very first player in chess history to regain the title after losing it. But he wouldn't live to face another challenger. He died shortly after World War II, before another match could take place, making the 1937 World Chess Championship the last event where the champion had control of the title and could set match conditions. World War II sidelined the championship for 10 years. And after Ayekin's death in 1946, for the first time since 
1886, no reigning champion existed. His death created a gap between reigns of world champions. The International Chess Federation, commonly referred to by its French acronym, FIDE, or the Fédération Internationale des Échecs, seized the moment. It would take control of the next World Chess Championship. Their solution was a tournament featuring a quintuple round robin of top players to determine the best player in the world. The roster was a who's who in the chess world. The Soviet Union's Mikhail Botvinnik was a favorite leading into the competition. Paul Kerez, another USSR player in his early 30s, was already a veteran of international play. An accountant by day, Samuel Ryshevsky was a Polish-American grandmaster and eight-time U.S. chess champion. Another participant was 1935 world champion Max Ova, who had not been playing well in recent years. Rounding out the five was Vasily Smyslov, a rising star and already a strong player who had emerged during World War II. He had not played in the AVRO tournament, which was considered the most important chess event in 1938, but the Soviet Union was allowed to substitute him as a competitor in place of Salo Flor. Finally, three years after the war ended, it was time for the tournament to take place. Matches were set for The Hague and Moscow. Travel restrictions were still in place in much of the Soviet Union. The Soviets' installation of communist-leaning governments in Eastern Europe spurred American and British fears that communism would spread worldwide. The tournament got underway as planned. Mikhail Botvinnik had plus scores against all of the players in the round-robin style tournament and became the sixth world chess champion, winning the tournament convincingly. In subsequent years, he tied two matches to retain his title. He also lost and regained the title twice. Botvinnik also helped to pioneer computer chess in the years to come. Botvinnik's victory marked the beginning of the era of Soviet domination of international chess, an era that would last over 20 years. Mikhail Botvinnik's impact and influence over the game throughout Eastern Europe and throughout the former Soviet Union is greater than nobody before or after him. Chess was huge in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was an everyday life. People played uh, uh, chess uh, in their spare time. Uh, it was very common to follow tournaments and matches. And especially in 1950s, 1960s, it was one of the biggest sports out there. Mihail Botvinnik, the father of the Soviet Chess Union, the man who would set the tone for generations to come and help the Soviet Union rise to world dominance, not just because of his dominance as a world chess champion, but because of his influence over the chess culture. He also had like this, almost like a rock star status for the best chess players. Um, but I think the foundation of that was like, they were literally millions of people who play chess as, you know, like a, as a hobby. In the Stalin years, catch up and overtake was a central theme in the Soviet ethos. By the time Mikhail Botvinnik won the 1948 World Chess Championship, the Soviets had done more than catch up to the world's best players. They could overtake them in nearly any match. Botvinnik's first opportunity to defend the world title he won in 1948 came in 1951, in the first match played under the supervision of FIDE. His challenger, David Bronstein, was the first chosen through a new qualifying system based on interzonal and candidates' tournaments. This selection method remained in place until 1993. If Brunstein's name sounds familiar, it's because his book, Zurich International Chess Tournament 1953, is widely considered one of the greatest chess books ever written. Grandmaster Brunstein, described by his peers as a creative genius and master of tactics, appeared to be a strong opponent. The men battled game by game. The match ended in a 12-12 tie. According to the rules, that's all Botvinnik needed to retain the title of world champion. Botvinnik held on to the title against challenger Vasily Smyslov in the same fashion 
at the 1954 World Chess Championship in Moscow. Harry Golombek, the author of the book World Chess Championship 1954, classified the style of Smyslov in this manner. Rich originality in the openings, imaginative strategy in the middle game, and above all, an immense virtuosity as an endgame player. In this last department, he is probably the strongest player in the world. As for Botvinnik, Golombek writes, other players may have a wider knowledge of the openings. Some few may have an even more impeccable technique, but no one has the equivalent strength of mind and willpower. Again, Botvinnik retained his status as world champion, but Botvinnik and Smyslov's rivalry was only beginning. The 1957 World Chess Championship was a rematch of the 1954 fight against Smyslov. This time, Botvinnik decided not to use a second in the match. A second essentially assists the player by helping prepare openings and studying the opponent's games. The move came after Botvinnik feared that his second had leaked information in the 1954 match against Smyslov. Unwilling to trust anyone else, he went at it alone, but it was a decision that might have cost him. After 22 of 24 games, the score was 12 and a half to nine and a half in Smyslov's favor. The margin did not change with two draws in the remaining games, and thus, Botvinnik had to hand over the title to Smyslov. FIDE rules at the time allowed Botvinnik a rematch. This time, a year later, he came ready to win. In the third match between these opponents, Botvinnik won the first three games. It was an early lead that Smyslov could not overcome. Botvinnik was back on top. Botvinnik was uh, one of the first pioneers of scientific chess, of method, of preparation. Uh, but really, method is probably the most important word. Uh, he was also special because he was uh, able to discover new ways of playing with black for victory from move one. To fully appreciate the 1960 World Chess Championship between defending champion Mikhail Botvinnik and challenger Mikhail Tal, you have to know what happened 12 years earlier. Botvinnik had just won the 1948 tournament. He celebrated with a vacation in Riga, Latvia. While there, an 11-year-old boy paid him a visit hoping to play a game against the new champion. Botvinnik's wife told the boy the champ was asleep. The boy was Mikhail Tal. In all the years that followed, the two had never faced each other before the title match began in 1960. Tal won the opportunity to play Botvinnik by beating players such as Paul Keres, Tigran Petrosian, and a 16-year-old Bobby Fischer. The youngest player to ever win the USSR championship. Some called him a creative genius. Surprise attacks and confusing moves seemed to be Tal's strategy. This earned him the nickname, the Wizard of Riga. Before it was even over, one newspaper article with the headline, Russian champ losing title to smashing surprise tactics, claimed Tal was using psychological warfare against Botvinnik. The match ended after only 21 games. Obviously, Tal was the, the most gifted tactician and um, magician of chess, so he is famous for that, obviously. He completely upended the game, so he showed that you can win at the highest level with this style uh, that nobody thought possible before. He changed the game, to, he made chess much more dynamic. Tal was declared the new world chess champion by four points, but he wouldn't hold the title for long. A year later, Tal and Botvinnik met in a rematch. Tal, who suffered from kidney problems, exacerbated by his drinking and smoking, was reportedly advised by his doctors that he should postpone the match. Botvinnik agreed only if doctors certified him unfit. Tal went ahead with the match. The great Botvinnik had studied Tal's style and was now more prepared for the 1961 World Chess Championship. He beat Tal by a margin of 13 to eight and regained his title. This man with iron will and iron discipline who lost 
many many world championship matches but always went back studied his weaknesses fixed his problems came back and won the next match a year later tao was operated on and the severity of his kidney disease was revealed but vinik's next challenger was soviet armenian grandmaster tigran vartanovich petrosian petrosian's victory at the 1962 candidates tournament which earned him the right to challenge Botvinnik, came with controversy. American Bobby Fischer accused the Soviets of collusion. He claimed Petrosian and others arranged match draws to prevent Fischer from winning. Though nothing was proven, Fide adjusted the rules and format for subsequent events. Iron Tigran, as he was called, prepared for the 1963 World Championship in a most unusual way. In addition to practicing chess, Petrosian spent several hours a day skiing. He believed that physical fitness would make the difference in long matches. Petrosian is probably the most um, uh, unusual world championship and most difficult to describe. Uh, he had a very special style. Uh, he was had enormous sense of danger that allowed him to uh, defend positions that are probably wouldn't be tenable for other grandmasters and also for preventing the uh, attacks before they even like commenced. Um, that probably was the thing that was most special about Petrosian. The match, which would be the last for Botvinnik, ended with a score of 5-2 to two, with 15 draws. Petrosian would become the ninth world chess champion. Botvinnik who did not have the automatic right for a rematch this time, did not re-enter the World Championship cycle, and would eventually retire from competitive play in 1970. He is still called the Patriarch of Soviet Chess for becoming the first Soviet Grandmaster and spending a lot of time coaching young players in later years. But Vinik died of pancreatic cancer in 1995, one of the critical players in the Soviet era of chess supremacy. Botvinnik was universally acknowledged by the Soviets as the patriarch, the, the man who did it, who brought the title back. He brought the title back to Mother Russia and it stayed in Mother Russia for a long time. Boris Spassky was another giant of Soviet chess. His start with chess began during the infamous siege of Leningrad in World War II. He played his first game of chess on the train as his family evacuated. Spassky was highly coached for competition throughout his early years. He was described as a universal player, equally adept at attack and defense at any stage of the game. His skills would be put to the test at the 1966 World Chess Championship against reigning champ Tigran Petrosian. The format for the title match was once again best of 24 games. With the champion retaining the title, in the event of a 12-12 tie. After game 22 of the match, the score was 12-10, and Petrosian retained the title by default. A few years later, Spassky would get another shot. In 1969, the two men met for a rematch, as Spassky had again won the candidates tournament, with the title of World Chess Champion on the line once more. It went down to 23 games, this time, Spassky won. The traditional thing to say about Spassky is that he was the universal player, so he was able to do a little bit of everything at the highest level. People said that uh, Spassky was very difficult to play because he could uh, be a chameleon, he could be play any style on any day. So I think that was uh, his biggest uh, uh, talent uh, when he was becoming a world champion. So Fischer Spassky, I remember it very, very clearly, yes. Fischer had crushed the competition on the way to becoming the challenger. He outplayed Grandmasters Mark Taimanov and Bent Larsen, beating each by a perfect score of 6-0, a feat no one else had ever accomplished in any candidate's event. After that, he eliminated former world champion Tigran Petrosian, 6.5 to 2.5, to qualify for the biggest challenge of his life. The uh, 1972 World Chess Championship match between Fischer and Spassky was probably the greatest spectacle in the history of chess. Uh, it was front page news every day. It was on evening uh, television coverage, uh, the news there. It was all over the place. 
I think that was the golden age of Soviet chess, and maybe chess in general. It was perceived as a clash between uh, ideologies, you know, democracy and uh, dictatorship, the Soviet megalithic system versus uh, raw-boned American individualism, uh, as uh, expressed by Fischer. But actually, it was just a match between the two best chess players in the world. The championship in Reykjavik, Iceland, was billed as the match of the century. It was the first time in 24 years the World Chess Championship was played outside the USSR. You couldn't walk into a bar without uh, people watching these five-hour games every other day. It was a very big thing. Fisher's pre-match demands should have been an indicator of what was to come. The American Grandmaster demanded more prize money, a larger cut of the movie rights, and he insisted that the match chessboard be remade as a Staunton chess set from Jacques of London. There were moments when it looked like the match wasn't going to happen at all. Fisher failed to make it to the opening ceremony. After a two-day delay, a British investment banker upped the prize fund. Henry Kissinger, national security advisor for then-President Richard Nixon, reportedly called Fisher and said, America wants you to go over there and beat the Russians. Fisher eventually landed in Reykjavik mere hours before forfeiting the match. And finally, the match got underway. It was a nail-biter from start to finish, both in and out of gameplay. Fisher didn't show up for the start of game one. Spassky made his move and waited. Nine minutes passed before Fisher arrived. Spassky won the first game after his opponent had played a bishop move that looked like a rookie mistake. Fisher blamed the TV cameras for the loss and demanded they be removed for the second game. Organizers refused. Fisher responded by forfeiting the game, handing Spassky another win in the match. Spassky deserves huge credit for saving the match by agreeing to play the third game out of the view of spectators. Game four was a compromise. Play resumed back on the main stage in front of spectators, but without TV cameras. The game ended in a draw. Fisher's behavior and demeanor seemed to suggest he was not prepared to compete. But out of nowhere, he took command of the match, winning games five, six, and eight. The final score after 21 games was 12 and a half to eight and a half. Bobby Fischer was the new world champion. It was an embarrassing loss to the Soviet chess dynasty. Fischer became the first American to win the competition since 1894. The victory also interrupted 24 years of Soviet domination. Spassky, it's actually a tragedy in a, in a way. The, the, the guy's best known for losing a match. And he did so much more than this in his chess career. But, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, it's sometimes your fate in life to be known for a defeat rather than, you know, all the many, many victories that you've, you've had over those years. Fisher was an instant global celebrity. He returned to his home in New York, where he celebrated an official day in his honor. The Einstein of chess, as he was called, appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated and made several appearances on television. Then, in a dramatic fashion, Fisher gave up the title of world chess champion. It was 1975. Fisher wanted the rematch format to go back to the same format used in the first world championship, complaining the current format leads players to opt for a draw instead of going for the win. Fide accepted all his demands except for one. Fisher wanted to keep his title in the event of a 9-9 score. When the two sides could not come to terms, Fisher forfeited his title. Anatoly Karpov won the title from Fisher without having to play him, but that should take nothing away from just how great he was. Anatoly Karpov would be one of the hardest nuts to crack of any world chess champion in history. And he was also someone who showed just how much you could win, not just by executing on your own plans, but by stopping your opponent's plan. As for Bobby Fischer, he lived a secluded life for two decades before he and Boris Spassky would meet again in an unofficial rematch in 1992. 
The only catch was that the match was held in Yugoslavia, which was under a United Nations embargo at the time. Fischer went ahead with the match, despite a warning from the United States government that his participation would have consequences. U.S. authorities issued a warrant for Fischer's arrest. Fischer never returned to the United States and died in Iceland in 2008. Bobby Fischer burned brighter than anybody else. You know, when he was hot, he was absolutely on fire. All the great players who came after Bobby Fischer were inspired by him, even if they now put down his play and, and uh, possibly detract from it a little bit. He was really something. He really changed the game of chess, put a new face on it. Defending champion, Russian Anatoly Karpov, had a lot to prove after FIDE declared him the new champion upon Bobby Fischer's forfeiture of the title. Karpov's challenger in the 1978 fight was Viktor Korchnoi, one of the Soviet Union's top grandmasters until he defected to the West in 1976. The competitors argued over the smallest details. When Korchnoi indicated he wanted to bring his own chair to the event, Karpov requested that it be examined. The men also argued over the flags on the player's table, after which the decision was made not to use any player flags at all. Then there were the sunglasses. Korchnoi wore reflective glasses, complaining that Karpov and his team, which included a well-known hypnotist, were staring at him. Karpov said the light reflected in the sunglasses bothered his eyes. At one point in the tournament, Karpov's team sent blueberry yogurt. The Korchnoi team accused the Soviets of using the yogurt as some kind of code. By game eight, tensions were so high that Karpov refused to shake Korchnoi's hand. Karpov was on the brink of victory with a 5-2 lead. But Korchnoi fought back to tie the match. All the arguing, political maneuvering, and psychological warfare culminated in the next game. Karpov won and retained his world title. Korchnoi would challenge Karpov a second time, this time in Murano, Italy in 1981. This time, Korchnoi had no time for drama. He was still trying to get his wife and son out of the Soviet Union, which seemed to distract him from the match. In the rematch, it took Karpov just 18 games to secure the title, earning the match the nickname the massacre in Murano. People have uh, forgotten how strong Karpov was, and I think his legacy is, I don't know if it's tarnished, but it's easily forgotten. And the beginning of the, um, the 1984 match was one of the most impressive displays of, of chess ever seen. The tournament pitted defending champion Anatoly Karpov against challenger, 21-year-old Gary Kasparov, who had won the candidates' tournament. Gary Kasparov was the opposite of Karpov in many ways. He, uh, his style is very different. Uh, but they were both products of the Soviet school of chess. They were both products of Botvinnik school. They both knew how the system worked. Kasparov was a loud-mouthed <laughs> troublemaker, seen as kind of Western, and he, he was, I think, perceived as the coming of Perestroika and Glasnost, which was just beginning to become a, you know, a talking point. The 1984 match started off in September, and Karpov was off to a solid start. After nine games, he needed only two more wins to be the first to win six games and retain the title. But Kasparov wasn't going down without a fight. 17 draws followed. Finally, at game 32, Kasparov won a game against the reigning champ. By game 47, Kasparov was gaining ground, but both men were showing signs of exhaustion. Officials were concerned about the strain on the player's health. The men wanted to continue, but in a controversial move, the president of the World Chess Federation ended the match nearly five months from the day it started. The men would meet again seven months later in a new world championship. Many considered it a restart of the abandoned match. 
This time, the tournament would be played as the best of 24 games to prevent another lengthy, seemingly endless battle. The men traded wins and draws in the first several games. As the match wore on and the draws piled up, both men felt the psychological pressure to push for a decisive victory. After game 15, the match was still tied. Then came game 16 and what some would call Kasparov's masterpiece. It was a Sicilian Paulson. The first 10 moves of the game were identical to those from game 12. Karpov was the first to deviate. 34 moves later, Karpov was forced to sacrifice his queen. Kasparov took the lead. The 1985 World Chess Championship came down to the last game. It was a must win for Karpov. Karpov resigned on move 42. Kasparov would defend his title three more times against Karpov, once in 1987 and again in 1990. Both matches were incredibly close, with Kasparov narrowly winning. I was 15 years old when Karpov uh, and Kasparov played their first World Championship match. And I was 21 years old and they had still not finished playing each other. They had one of these remarkable rivalries and by matches which dwarfed the lengths of modern matches. Growing up and watching Kasparov dominate the chess world is, is something I, I still remember vividly because, of course, for every young chess player, I don't think there was a single one on the planet who didn't idolize uh, everything that he was. Gary's two years older than me. Honestly speaking, there is a difference in class. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a good player at my best. I was a very good player, but he was on, on a level higher than that. In 1993, Nigel Short won the Candidates Tournament, putting him in a position to challenge Garry Kasparov for the World Chess Championship. At that time, the final was decided by the reigning champion, the challenger, and FIDE. But when FIDE announced Manchester as the venue, without consulting Kasparov and Short, the men cut their ties to the organization. You know, for me, this whole thing was done on a point of principle. And I, it was deep, deep dissatisfaction with the way the proceedings were conducted. Kasparov and Short formed the Professional Chess Association in retaliation to the FIDE decision and set about playing the World Chess Championship under its terms. The match took place at the Savoy Theatre in London, where Kasparov won handily 12 and a half to 7 and a half, becoming the first PCA World Chess Champ. FIDE wasn't backing down. It stripped Kasparov of his previous World Chess title and held its own version of the World Championship between the next highest ranking players in the candidates tournament. Anatoly Karpov and Jan Timman competed in FIDE's 1993 title match. Karpov won. For the first time, we had two world chess champions. One thing I can say about playing Kasparov is the the level of in, in, the intensity of playing a world championship final. It was an immense strain in the full public view. Loads of publicity. Um, it was hard, and it took me a while to get used to it. In the 14th century, the Western Schism resulted in two different men claiming to be the true Pope. The rise of different boxing associations in the 1960s resulted in the use of the term undisputed to determine the true boxing champ. By the 1990s, the chess world would experience its own power struggle. Kasparov was declared the PCA world champ again in 1995. In 1996 and 1998, Anatoly Karpov beat Gatakamsky and Viswanathan Anand, respectively, for the FIDE title. FIDE actually tried to unify the rival titles by breaking with tradition and proposing a new knockout style tournament that had been used in lower level matches. The plan was to seed FIDE champion Anatoly Karpov and PCA champion Garry Kasparov directly into the semifinals. 
But Kasparov didn't want to defend his title under those circumstances and declined his invitation. So Karpov was given a spot in the final instead. He beat Viswanathan Anand in a match played in Switzerland. FIDE used the single elimination format for the next few years, despite the controversy surrounding the new structure. Critics of the format said the short matches and rapid playoff style left too much to chance and didn't ensure that the best player would win. Others liked the fact that more players could be included and thought it made scheduling easier since only one venue was needed. Under this format, Alexander Kalifman became the FIDE World Champion in 1999, beating Vladimir Okopian in Las Vegas. In 2000, both the PCA and FIDE organized championships. On the PCA side, Russian player Vladimir Kromnik ended Kasparov's reign in a close match played in London. There was a turning of the page, I guess, in welcoming Kromnik as, um, as his successor. In the same year, rising Indian star Vishwanathan Anand earned the FIDE world title after beating Alexei Shirov in a match played in India and Iran. Only FIDE organized the championship in 2002. Ukrainian player Ruslan Ponomaryov won the single elimination event held in Moscow. And in 2004, Kramnik defended his title in a match that ended 2-2 with 10 draws. A draw was not enough for Hungarian Peter Leko to unseat Kramnik. In the FIDE Championship of 2004, Rustam Kazimzhanov beat Michael Adams. FIDE eventually abandoned the single elimination format. In 2005, the governing organization decided to use normal time controls, returning the matches to a much slower pace. Eight top players were named in a double round robin. In the end, Veselin Topalov was declared the 2005 FIDE winner, besting Vishwanathan Anand and Peter Svidler, who tied for second. The title had been split for 13 years, and it was time to unite the chess world and produce an undisputed world champion. The World Chess Championship of 2006 was the unifying match between the PCA's classical world chess champion, Vladimir Kramnik, and FIDE world chess champion, Veselin Topalov. Vladimir Kramnik defeated Topalov. After that, FIDE regained control of the World Chess Championship, and the match reverted to being based on a final match between the defending champion and a challenger decided by the candidate's tournament. What impresses me most about Kromnik as a player, I guess he he's one of the most accurate players in history that I think doesn't get enough credit for the fact that like, like the next generation coming after Kasparov, and we talked about the fact that Kasparov welcomed the machines, Kromnik was using machines to influence his style of play, I think, earlier than people realized. He's one of the deepest thinkers in strategy and openings in chess. Um, in fact, given that he had much less help than many others, uh, his impact is even greater. He has this um, ability, I think, to teach and explain chess that's uh, unique. Vishwanathan Anand is a five-time world chess champion. Born in India in 1969, Anam learned to play chess from his mother when he was six. By the time he was 14, he was winning tournaments like the Asian Junior Championship, National Chess Championship, and the World Junior Chess Championship. All on his way to becoming India's first grandmaster at age 18. Anand has been one of the most well-regarded figures in the chess world for two decades, earning the respect of chess rivals and champions alike. I must say that I admire Rishi a lot because I think he was one of the uh, world champions, probably the only world champion, who won uh, world champion titles in every single format, with every single time control, with every single system that existed, matches, knockout, I mean, and he never, well, in my um, memory at least, he never complained. He won his first world champion title in 2000 in a 100-player single elimination tournament in New Delhi, India, and Tehran. Backed by home crowd support, Anand moved through the early rounds with little trouble. His momentum stalled in the quarterfinals with a streak of draws. But it was enough to keep advancing. 
The final match pitted Anand against Alexei Shirov. Anand won the coveted title, going undefeated in the tournament with 8 wins and 12 draws. The win made Anand the first world champion from Asia and the first world champion from outside the former Soviet Union since Bobby Fischer. Anand received a $528,000 cash prize for winning the FIDE world title. To talk about Vishwanathan Anand's achievements in chess and what he represents to the game becoming truly global is, is, is hard to put into words. I, I think people forget that before Vichy Anand, every world chess champion other than Robert James Fisher was of former Soviet State Union descent in some way. 2007 marked the beginning of four straight world title wins for Anand. In Mexico City, Anand beat Vladimir Kramnik and Boris Galfand in a double round robin tournament. If you win a world title, you should be able to say, I am the world chess champion and finish your sentence, so to speak. Um, so when I won the world title in 2007 in Mexico City, it had been reunified for just under a year at that point. And I felt one big weight off my shoulders. This feeling that I had to explain my title had almost disappeared. In 2008, Anand again defeated Vladimir Kramnik in a best of 12 match. Then in 2010, he narrowly defeated Veselin Topolov. Three wins, two losses, and seven draws. The 2010 World Chess Championship was not only a testament to Anand's fortitude, but also to his stellar reputation. Anand's flight to the championship game in Sofia, Bulgaria was originally canceled due to a volcanic eruption in Iceland. When the Bulgarian organizers refused to delay the games, Anand traveled 40 hours by car to get there. And if that wasn't a rough enough start, Anand lost the first game to Topalov in just 30 moves. But the reigning champ didn't back down. After 11 games, the score was tied, five and a half to five and a half. Anand signaled his willingness to accept a draw in game 12. Topalov didn't want to take his chances against Anand in a forced rapid playoff, given Anand's reputation as a formidable rapid player. But Topalov couldn't convert the game to a win. Anand retained his world champion title by one point. After the tournament, Anand revealed that former rivals Garry Kasparov, Vladimir Kramnik, and even Magnus Carlsen helped him prepare for the 2010 World Chess Championship. Anand's regard as a good sportsman was evident when Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh invited him to a dinner he was hosting for US President Barack Obama in November of 2010. Anand was the only sports person invited. Finally, in 2012, Anand would win the world champion title just one more time, beating Boris Gelfand in Moscow. To say the statement, with where we are now for India, that Vishwanathan Anand was the first grand master in that country is absolutely mind-blowing and probably nothing else needs to be said to really understand his greatness and legacy uh, in that now we're talking about many of the world's best chess players being Indian. Of course, growing up, I dreamt of becoming a world champion. Even if I didn't quite know what that involved or meant, uh, but when I finally became world champion, I could then realize that um, there was some, um, I had done something historical and I had broken through a barrier and you know, from now on, uh, India would always have its first world champion. When Magnus Carlsen took the torch from Vichy Anand, I think it was generally accepted that the time had come and that Magnus was maybe the best chess player uh, overall, at least in all facets of the game. Magnus Carlsen has been the world chess champion since 2013. Born in 1990, his rise to become one of the best players of the game ever is nothing short of spectacular. But before Carlsen was known as a chess prodigy, he was just a five-year-old boy who wasn't motivated by the lure of prestigious titles. He was motivated initially by beating his older sister at chess. After finally defeating his sister, soon Carlson was playing against himself, reading chess books, and being coached by the top players in Norway. By the age of 13, 
he was a grandmaster. By the age of 17, he was the Norwegian chess champion. And by the age of 18, he surpassed a 2800 rating. The Washington Post dubbed him the Mozart of chess. After years of raising eyebrows and earning praise, Carlson finally got his chance at the world chess title in 2013. His win over reigning champ Vishy Anand in Anand's home country of India was heralded by former champ Garry Kasparov as the start of a new era in chess. The young Carlson, who developed his game in the age of super chess computers, won by three points in 10 of 12 scheduled games. The two men reversed their roles in the 2014 World Chess Championship. This time, Carlsen was the reigning champ and Anand was the challenger. According to the World Championship's website, the 2014 title match drew more than 1 million viewers a day, breaking global audience records. They didn't have to play the scheduled 12 games. It took only 11 for Carlsen to score the required six and a half points needed to be declared the winner. Objectively, it's hard to say that Magnus Carlsen isn't the greatest player of all time. What makes him so great? He's a genius. First, he's obviously a genius. He's brilliant. He perceives things on another level. He, he probably understands higher level, level principles that haven't quite been articulated, that maybe can't even be put into words. Magnus Carlsen also has a photographic memory, but also natural ability, natural talent. It's not only about like memory, but about um, being able to focus, to concentrate, to handle the pressure. There are so many things that uh, make uh, a player a great player. The 2016 World Chess Championship pitted Carlsen against Russian Grandmaster Sergei Karyakin, who had been one of the youngest Grandmasters in history. After 12 games, the score was tied. The match format called for Rapid Chess to break the tie. Carlsen ultimately held on to his title, but the rapid playoff ending to the World Chess Championship drew criticism. Other respected players, such as four-time US champion Yasser Sirawan and former world champion Anatoly Karpov, called it inappropriate. Since there was already a World Rapid Championship, it wouldn't be the last time a rapid speed game would determine the title. In 2018, Carlson's challenger was Italian-American player Fabiano Caruana. The prize fund was 1 million euros. The format was 12 classical time control games with a rapid speed playoff in the event of a tie. Every one of the 12 games ended in a draw. It was the only time in World Chess Championship history that all the classical games ended in a draw. Carlson won three consecutive rapid speed games to retain his title. Magnus Carlson's win in 2021 against Jan Nepomniachtchi puts him in the elite club of players with five or more world titles, which includes Emmanuel Lasker, Mikhail Botvinnik, Anatoly Karpov, Garry Kasparov, and Viswanathan Anand. Since its beginning 1,500 years ago, chess has reflected the people, the politics, and the world in which we live. The game itself is ever demanding and evolving. Its champions determined and steadfast in their quest for perfect play. There are so many reasons why chess is appealing, of course. Um, I was captivated, captivated by the game from the start, as many players have been. Um, I just loved it, and that's really what it's about, loving the game, realizing how much fun it can be. It's, it's sheer play, uh, the challenge of it, um, overcoming difficulty. You, you be set with problems at the chessboard and drawing upon your resources to find just the right move will bring a smile to just about anyone's face. While technology has provided a new frontier for teaching, analyzing, and training, it has also been instrumental in expanding the fan base, ensuring that the game will continue to entertain and challenge generations to come.